the, the next presentation will be in 3D change detection on digital elevation models and uh, will be done by three people, Jordan Bates and uh, Muhammad and Tan Moy. <laughs> and we have met each other at various places <laughs> before, <laughs> like Phosphorchi in Tanzania and in Kyoki uh, Isiosu Conference in Akurunya already, so <laughs> we see each other <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Uh, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Jordan, like you said, and this is Hassan and Tanmoy. Um, we are all three students in the Erasmus Mundus Masters of Science at Geospatial Technology. Um, this project was just a part of a final project in a course. Uh, we decided to develop a plugin for QGIS uh, within a month, a couple of weekends, um, and uh, this is what we came with. Um, it's titled 3D Change Detection, a QGIS plugin with Python 3. Um, so saying that, it is a relatively modest uh, plugin, but we believe that it is being used for a, a purpose that could be trending and also give you some ideas with uh, those, those uh, trends. Um, so a little bit more about our program. Um, like I said, it's the Resus Mundus Master of Science in Geospatial Technology. Um, it's from the European uh, Commission. It gives grant money to these three universities, University of Yame, uh, University of Munster, and also the University of Nova at Lisbon. And they bring in uh, students from all over uh, the world. Um, and in particular to this, uh, this year for the 2020 graduating class, um, those are the 20 countries that are represented in this program. So it is uh, quite diverse. It is a, a beautiful program. Um, and so uh, the three of us have become uh, pretty great friends uh, among the two semesters. We've been working together on many projects. Um, what's funny is that we often get reminded of how unique our relationship is, even when we were coming into uh, customs into Romania, uh, when they heard that uh, we were traveling together and we were friends, one from Bangladesh, one from Pakistan, and one from the United States. They're like, something has to be going on. This is very suspicious. And then we told them that we go to school together. And they're like, okay, now you're lying. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, so uh, also we want to talk about um, a conference. Uh, one of our courses is to increase air capacity and uh, management. And so we design our own conference and put it on as well. And it's going to be hosted this year in Castellon, uh, Spain. Um, and it's free registration. You just show up and you can hang out with us and talk about GIS. Um, if you're feeling uh, a little, be, want to be a little more involved and actually submit a paper to talk about, you can actually receive 500 euros in grant money to travel there as well. So we, we'd love to have you guys and t continue to talk about GIS topics. Um, okay, going back to the plugin now. Um, so yeah, once again, the title is 3D Change Detection. We just recently published it into the QGIS repository. Um, and the whole plugin, um, it's not, it's a lot of, uh, not new uh, functionalities, there's a lot of native functionalities, but it's going to be used for a uh, uh, type of use case that we think is unique, but also going to be trending in uh, future terms, uh, such as unmanned aircraft systems and more aerial data that's uh, very uh, detailed. You can get very beautiful DSMs and DTMs from that, and, what, and we have applied tools to help you um, create change detection and also uh, assess the errors and accuracy um, of those functions. So, uh, like we said, uh, on my aircraft industry, uh, everyone knows this. Uh, it's the cool thing now. Everyone's using drones and getting very detailed uh, data. Uh, so, for an instance, just to show you the example of that, uh, traditional satellite data, uh, 30 meters uh, ground sampling distance, and that's what it would look like. And the same area being mapped with a UMID aircraft system, which we mapped ourselves with the Phantom 4, um, you can get 15 centimeters uh, ground sampling distance, and you can see uh, how detailed it can be when you put in a 3D viewer and QGIS um, with those pixel values for Z. Um, and so, yeah, the idea of development was uh, with this, uh, with uh, digital service models becoming more detailed, um, we thought that people might start uh, implementing use cases like this that we're going to be show showing you and talking to you about. Um, and we wanted to simplify and automate that process, which takes um, quite a few different tools to make this happen, along with also when you get to the error assessment part, uh, uh, it gets 
pretty uh, tasking, so we wanted to automate that. And then also for those that aren't experts and also new to GIS, uh, some type of open source tool for them to use, uh, maybe for those that are coming from the drone industry and wanted to do some of a change detection with uh, DSMs. Also, um, we think we came up with somewhat of a unique, unique idea to um, do an air assessment with uh, DSMs that are created from unmanned aircraft systems or aerial data, whether it be photogrammetry or LIDAR when they're being interpolated into those DEMs. Um, and how to um, see how accurate they are. Um, so yeah, this is the user interface for the plugin. Um, so first off, it's just simply the old raster, the new raster, and then the functionalities we've included um, were the minimum change threshold that you can put, which you change that based on the sensor accuracy um, that you, you're using, um, and then also the data alignment. Um, it's really hard to get a pixel to pixel alignment perfectly even using ground control points, so you wanna also to find that threshold based on what you think that uh, misalignment is between those two DEMs. And then also, depending on your project's focus, uh, how much change are you actually looking for that's significant to yourself. Um, and then also we have the shape file mask that you can put in there, whether that be the building footprints. For instance, if you're doing like change detection for disasters between uh, buildings, if you have the data before and after, um, you can just do those building footprints and eliminate all the other noise around the buildings and just focus on the buildings. Or define a study area, on other applications such as river basins, and also this improves processing time. Uh, and then also we have the error probability maps, which is an, option, uh, an optional functionality like we've been talking about that uh, we believe is kind of unique, um, that uh, shows you where possible errors are when you're generating DEMs from point clouds from photogrammetry and LiDAR data. And also we have a help button because we've created a wiki page on the GitHub page which explains all this to you and the instructions. So yeah, this is uh, just a quick methodology of how that the GUI we've created and all the the, uh, the functions that are within the plugin uh, and um, the whole process. And so the output would look like this if you actually use uh, uh, building footprints as the mask. And we actually manipulated the data a bit to show that if a roof caved in in this instance. And so you can see here um, with the surrounding area cut out, it's just leaving the buildings um, and showing what areas are actually damaged. Uh, for those buildings. And you can also apply other uh, base maps once that masks have been implemented as well. Um, and so this is another example if you're just gonna use it for a river basin. We got this example data for the Riverscapes uh, Consortium. And you can see here in the 3D viewer QGIS um, seeing the change, uh, the decrease in red and the increase in blue. And so I'm gonna hand it off to Tom so we can talk a little bit about the error assessment we did in this plugin. Um, hello. Uh, so the, one of the main problems when you are doing uh, working with high resolution imagery, for especially for DEMS, is that uh, there will always be data errors. Now these errors can be in the form of inconsistencies uh, or data gaps. Uh, for example, taking uh, photogrammetry, um, because of uh, reflective surfaces, uh, the data is not captured appropriately. And in case of LiDAR, there may be cliffs or some other sorts of uh, obstructions uh, that actually do not allow the data to be captured properly. So in these case uh, cases, when you take your data and you apply any kind of interpolation, uh, it's, it just becomes a mess. So what we tried to do was uh, we, tried, uh, we tried to find some literature on uh, how do we actually take the areas that, we, that is possibly can be an error. So uh, for example, this was the thing I was talking about, say for example, in the photogrammetry, your uh, data is missing because of the reflective surfaces. So as you can see, after the interpolation, there is an excessive of oversmoothing. So this oversmoothing, when applied uh, and you use the plugin, um, you, will get, you will get an answer. Obviously, you will get whether it's a, there is a decrease or increasing change. But the thing that you will not understand is whether actually that change is actually happening there or not. Because here, actually, this is actually a river, and because of the uh, over smoothing, you cannot actually figure out what is going on. So we tried to do the errors possibility calculation um, based on Riley's method, which was published in 1999. Um, it was uh, initially called as the ruggedness index. So, but we tried to apply the ruggedness index with relation to topography and slope. Uh, what was done here was that we all know that there is a D8 connectivity between the, uh, a single cell. So a single cell is surrounded by eight cells. So these eight cells have different elevations. Uh, some are higher, some are lower. 
So when you take a difference in the elevation, you get somehow, uh, you get a difference as positive or negative. So we square that difference between them, and then we take a square root of the uh, total sum of the errors. So this is the special heterogeneity that you get when you try to do any kind of ruggedness index, uh, topographic ruggedness index. Uh, these tools are, are presenting uh, QGIS and other, other, uh, other open free software, but the, the thing is that it, just with the help of that, you will not be able to identify which areas are actually uh, potentially have uh, errors in them. So what we did was uh, whenever there is an abrupt smoothing or any kind of abrupt change, we tried to apply a slope continuity function to that. So when you apply a slope continuity function to that, uh, you get an area that uh, that is supposed to change but is not changing or is supposed to uh, but is not changing but is supposed to change. So uh, the the algorithm basically takes out those areas which it probably thinks is a possibility. Uh, there is a small limitation here saying that because uh, since it is an error possibility map, so the user has to check whether it is actually an error or not. Most of the times we have found that actually it is an error, but sometimes uh, it also happens due to the bounding boxes, especially in buildings. Uh, just to show a bit more here. So basically this is one of the errors that we were talking about. Um, when you apply the error possibility algorithm to this, so you get these extracted areas. Now, these have actually come very properly. I did not, we did not even think that uh, it would come so nicely, but uh, it works. But there are some uh, possible uh, values that get interchanged, and uh, there is still a need for improvementing this, and that will be applied in our future uh, upgrade, uh, version upgrading this plugin. So what was the future is the type of things that the user needs to know about, like when I said about the bounding box, about the area. So as you can see, the correct one is actually the building that you are seeing uh, on the left, but the incorrect one. But sometimes uh, these kind of changes are also not taken up by the error possibility map um, because of the, uh, it's, it is surrounded by a specific slope. So it does not actually basically understand whether there is actually a changing slope that was not supposed to be there or there was a, uh, no changing slope that was supposed to be there. So these kind of things are some of the uh, future assessment. We are trying to uh, evaluate the algorithm inside a bounding box, especially for buildings, so that you can actually uh, see the error possibility more. And you can also have a, a confidence level as to what the error actually is. Uh, now I'll hand it over to uh, Hassan. Thank you. So here we take a look at the use case that we tested this plugin on. And uh, basically what we did was collect uh, the drone data for this region ourselves. And this is just showing all the sample points where we took the uh, information from. And it's just a fly through of the area. As you can see, we uh, collected a lot of data to get this uh, high resolution DEM using the Phantom 4 drone as Jordan already said. And it's just a nice way to see how it actually flew, we, what, what were the points where we actually collected the data from. And uh, what is the basic concept is that you take, uh, you fly the drone and get collect the data before a uh, disaster strikes. Uh, and uh, when a disaster strikes, you you fly the drone again and you collect again data. Uh, the data is not playing. It's fine. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So you collect the data again and you basically make a comparison between the DEM from before the disaster struck and after the disaster struck. And you identify the regions that are affected most, and this is, can be uh, the use case. De depending on the use case, you can change the threshold and get uh, different information. So, for example, if you're trying to find out uh, if uh, only the regions that had like complete collapse, you'd have to increase the threshold, and you can also use the threshold to cater for the uh, misalignment between the two DEMs that you get. Uh, this is a fly through of the data that we collected in QGIS. As you can see that it's, uh, oh. uh, I don't know why it stopped. Okay, so this is a working demo, a small demo. We, we clipped the area from that. And this is first we select the old uh, raster, uh, which is the DEM from before the disaster struck. And then we select the DEM from after the disaster struck. Then we add the mask to only uh, work on the data that we, areas that we want to work on. This could be like building uh, footprints and uh, areas where you want to focus the change detection on actually. Then you let the tool run and you get the output. Which, uh, yeah. 
you can then visualize in the 3D view and you can see uh, based on the uh, color map uh, ramp on the left side that these are the regions where the actual damage, the building, damaged buildings are. So what are the future plans? So the, as Jordan, I think, already said, the plugin is already available in the GitHub, uh, in the plugin repository, in the QGIS plugin repository, but we are still working on it and we have made some changes already, which we will upload pretty soon. And the things that we are currently working on are the resampling automation and uh, we are trying to improve the processing and to optimize the code because it takes a little bit time to process all these high resolution DEMs. And we're trying to get the, uh, use the new 3D functionalities that have been developed in QGIS 3 and are being developed in a very rapid pace and to incorporate them into the DEM and try to handle as many new error types as we can to make the plugin more stable and uh, cater for more use cases. Uh, in conclusion, what we've done here is we've used non-original functions for original applications and trying to address new trends. Uh, we've, but uh, our focus here has been on the high resolution D, uh, DEMs that are usually coming from UAVs and that is why the error possibility maps that we're creating are, having, uh, are basically based on the data that is coming from LIDARs or UAVs. Still, uh, we know that many improvements can be made and, since, uh, and it's, uh, the code is available on GitHub and we welcome all uh, contributions and all help and please try it out and let us know how uh, we can improve and please contribute as well. And uh, what we've done is uh, we've realized that new functionality needs have been found as more as more uh, more and more data has been collected and this specific use case is uh, because of the increase of the data that is being created by drones everywhere uh, thank you and any questions Um, thank you for this interesting presentation. Very nice also to see this international collaboration. And, uh, it's uh, definitely in the spirit of this conference, I think. And um, are there any questions on the plugin or on the change detection? Uh, hey, guys. Uh, great presentation. Thanks. Uh, I just have a question because, like, uh, you're, as far as the resolution spectrum is concerned, you're talking either about, about uh, UAS or SRTM was, was your comparison. And in the middle, you can have um, DSM from satellites, which is like one meter, basically. So my question is, um, what's the minimum resolution that you think is where it still makes sense to use your tool? As in like, you know, how will the error increase, uh, for example, for satellite-based DSM? Yeah, so we were, we were just talking about more like open source satellite imagery. I'm not sure if there's, is there open source one meter? Well, I guess you can find some. Okay. Yeah, not very common. Yeah, no. Um, so, yeah, I don't think the air possibility will really be applied to that situation. Um, it's more for those data that are coming from point cloud data being processed with a lot of the the typical drone uh, processing software using photo, whether it be through photogrammetry or also LIDAR and then interpolating that into a DEM. And, and when there's missing data, there's uh, over smoothing with those missing gaps in that interpolation. And so it's addressing that issue. So I don't think it would be applicable with the satellite data. No. Hi, yes. Uh, I've seen, I noticed that you used the PIX4D to do the calculations to create the DEM. So in your process of creation of the DEM, you used actually structure for motion techniques or you just took up the points and then you interpolated to create uh, the DEM? Uh, basically the question is how you generate the DEM? Through yeah, the, we used uh, QGIS. No, sorry, we used Pix PIX4D. PIX4D, so yes. the, uh, if I remember correctly, PIX4D uh, uses structure for motion to create the surface. Is that correct? It uses the motion? Structure for motion, structure. SFM. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> okay, and great. Uh, now, the next part of the question is that uh, 
uh, these surfaces, they do have an, um, an error surface. There is an error basically in its them. So when you are doing the change detection, are you somehow uh, propagating the errors of the two dems? So you would have uh, uh, the total error. No, we're just doing the error in the, the old one. Just old the difference. And the new one, and just saying that the when they're processed, yeah. In the threshold, if it's yeah. over that threshold, it's that. Uh, yeah, cool. that there, was, there was a probably a, a interpolation error on the old one, interpolation okay. error on yeah, the old yeah. one. So most likely, this change you're seeing here is not accurate. It's just the interpolation error. Good, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and also the change uh, from the error is also shown in purple, as you can see there. So even if you can see the change, uh, the the area is selected for you in purple so that you can actually notice that, okay, this is the area that I should be careful about before making a decision. Thank you. There's still time for questions, if you have any. Should have stayed there. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, I've got a question. What are the possible output formats from your uh, module? Okay. Um, yeah. It's raster. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you said was the processing time? No, no, no. What are the formats? Output. Oh, yeah, just raster. Just yeah. raster. Yeah. Okay. Were you considering shapefile, for example, for areas no, of? No. No. But I mean, that's something we could implement. We could. Okay. Put that as a optional functionality in the plugin, yeah. Yeah, okay, as thank you very much. Other good questions? Uh, that's quick and uh, quick question. How much time do you need to create one kilo, square kilometers of uh, your dam or something like this? Yeah, the use case actually was one point. F yeah, it was one and a half square kilometers. I think it took like an hour to process. Yeah, I know the whole the whole extent. It's like an hour. Oh, maybe thirty minutes. Yeah, it was fast as thirty minutes. We were able to do one and a half square kilometers. Any other comments or questions? If not, then uh, thank you again, and uh, yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, can prepare for the next speaker. Yeah.